Jesus. This is the last talk in this room for today. After that, there will be a post-group reception. Uh, and uh, right now, let me introduce uh, Bilal, Thomas and Bilal, who are both work for Microsoft. They are open source database hackers, according to this slide. And they're going to talk about streaming AI. Welcome, Bilal. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to our talk. So I'm going to start with a bit of a review of some operating system facilities that are relevant to databases and in particular how they access files. So I've got this bingo slide here where there's these three things that go together, direct IO, vected IO, and asynchronous IO. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll explain, you'll understand why all of these three things go together really nicely and why we're interested in all three of them. Uh, and they're all things that most other uh, relational databases use. Um, before I jump into the three things, I just want to say that it's quite interesting to note that if you look at the line of operating systems that Unix uh, descends from, so beginning with Multix, the kind of intellectual predecessor of Unix, and coming all the way down to Linux that most people probably in this room use today, um, Multics used to have support for asynchronous IO. In fact, it was in the name, multi, multi, multiplexing computing system or something like that. Um, and the idea was that you could start reads or writes to, to disks and you could get multiple read or write operations running at the same time, multiplexing them. And then you could uh, wait for any of them to be completed when you needed to do that. Um, and contemporary operating systems like the IBM mainframe operating systems and so on, and the VMS and, and later on Windows NT, which is somehow related, um, they all had asynchronous IO as a, as a basic, uh, you know, a starting point, right? And then um, the, the, the the Unix guys, uh, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson, they decided they were making something very, very simple, the uniplexing computing system, which is, I think it was uh, like a, I'm, I'm not sure that's the, officially, uh, the official name, but that that's one of the explanations for the name of Unix. They said, well, actually, almost all applications just want synchronous buffered IO. So they threw away all the rest of the complexity because it was pretty complex and hard to program with, especially in a programming language from the 1960s. Um, and then later on, uh, there've been various uh, sort of extensions to that, um, PREV, the vectored version and so on. Direct IO was um, a sort of a de facto standard with, uh, came along for that in the late 80s from SGI. Um, and then POSIX did actually standardize a way to do asynchronous IO in the, in the 90s, around the same time as Windows NT came out. Um, unfortunately, that never really caught on that well. Some, in fact, most of the implementations of it were terrible, and it doesn't really seem to be that uh, useful as a starting point. But later on, other things happened. Five years ago, IOU Ring came out on Linux, which has made a really big impact on the industry. There's all kinds of really cool stuff you can do with it. And so um, that's one of the sort of three things that... Uh, that we're, we're talking about in this talk. Okay, so the first of the three things is direct IO. Normally when you open a file in the usual way, you um, and, and then call read or write, when you read um, into a user space buffer, um, if the data is already in the kernel page cache, it just gets copied into your user space buffer and then it returns. If it's not already in the kernel page cache, then an IO begins. And at that point, the DMA hardware or um, engine or whatever on, on, on your storage hardware will transfer the data into your into the kernel page cache while your process is asleep and, and the CPU goes and does something else. Um, and uh, and then when, when finally that finishes, that, that data then gets copied into user space. If you use direct IO, on the other hand, um, you, you start the read or the write and the, D, the DMA hard, hardware does the transfer directly to the device, or at least in the best case, um, which means that you skip a whole lot of stuff and the interesting thing about that is that it's clearly an optimization in terms of CPU usage. There is none. RAM usage, there is none. But it's also a pessimization because when you call read, you, you have to go to sleep. There's no cache helping you, right? So it's a funny thing. It's both, a, both an optimization and a pessimization. But the pessimization comes from being synchronous. So you can see that's why we're suddenly interested in asynchronous I.O., right? Um, so who actually wants direct I.O.? Mostly it's databases. I mean, there are a few other classes of application that like to use direct IO. Uh, the main one that I've heard of is basically very large data systems where they're generating terabytes of data and they know, that, know they're not gonna read it back soon. So they might as well skip some stuff. They just want the highest throughput. Um, but mostly it's databases. 
And the reason is that they have their own buffer pool, which is similar to the kernel page cache. So it, it's um, really wasteful to have both of those things working at the same time. And that, uh, that um, graph that you see there that looks like a kind of a smile or a square root sign, that's, that's an interesting effect of, um, that you can see if you, sometimes paradoxically, you increase the shared buffer size, the buffer pool size, and TPS goes down on PGBench because it's no longer able to hold the full, full working set in both of these kind of mirrored um, caches. So double buffering can actually hurt you in surprising ways. Uh, and the best performance comes through not using it. Um, so in Postgres 16, we actually added a, a setting so you can turn on direct IO, but we gave it the name debug IO direct because we don't want anyone to actually use it yet because we don't have the rest of the infrastructure needed to make it work well. If you simply turn that on, things will mostly go slowly. And we released it sooner because we wanted to find out about uh, file systems or operating systems that, that it wouldn't work well with just for testing. And indeed, we did find that BTRFS uh, corrupts files when you turn that on. So that was quite interesting, and that's that's led to some more work being done. Um, so the second thing is vectored I/O. What is vectored I/O? You, you you want to read some data from a contiguous chunk of disk, and instead of reading it into one buffer in user space memory, you want to scatter it into several different buffers. And the reason we want to do that is because we have our own buffer pool, and it has it's it's very opinionated about where data should go. And we don't want to constrain it to give it additional constraints so that it has to provide uh, uh, contiguous address ranges for us. In any other application, pretty much anything that doesn't have a buffer pool type problem, you don't need vectored IO. If you want to do a bigger read, just allocate a bigger buffer. Our problem comes from having a, a highly opinionated memory allocator, right? And we don't want to change that because its job is already difficult enough. So that's the reason why you don't really hear about vectored IO too much outside database. Uh, implementation. Um, so the basic idea is that instead of calling pread with a buffer and a size, you call pread v with a pointer to a list of these IOVEC structures that uh, just allow you to scatter the data or gather it when you're writing, that's the word people use. So, right. so in Postgres 17, we have this new setting, IO combine limit, that causes Postgres to do bigger reads and writes using vectored IO. So vectored IO sounds kind of weird and complicated, but really all we want to do is do bigger reads and writes. Uh, the problem is that the placement of memory is not really under our control in the most straightforward way, so we have to use vectored IO. So in Postgres 17, you can there's this new setting, IO combine limit, and you will see Postgres doing larger reads than it did than Postgres 16 did um, with this new setting. And uh, Bilal will be explaining shortly how, how that actually works. The third thing of the, that set of three things is asynchronous IO. As I explained, Direct IO on its own, if you just turn it on, is kind of a pessimization because now you always have to wait for the for the disk to read or write. So what we want to do is start a read or write, then go away and do something useful with the CPU, and then at some point wait for the IO to complete. And if we separate those two points far enough in time, the wait doesn't even happen. We just wait and it instantly we just check that it's actually finished. Uh, and that's a kind of a, a, a much better way to um, get a lot of things happening at the same time and not give up your CPU time slice. So the simplest way to do that is simply to have IO workers, threads, or processes that are running regular synchronous uh, read or write calls. And that's very portable. It works, but it has some extra overheads because you've got communication between threads and you've got uh, you've got to decide how many threads to have. And I don't know, it's, you've just got a lot of overheads that are not strictly necessary. So on various operating systems, there are ways to get asynchronous IOs running. I mentioned IO Uring, but there are also things on Windows and some other uh, less commonly used operating systems that are equivalent, or at least for the purposes of this talk, they're equivalent. Um, so we, to, to actually use asynchronous IO, we don't have that in Postgres yet. Um, we have um, the, uh, patches in development, um, and we'll be talking about those a bit later in the talk. So that's the three things. Uh, so the big question is, what architectural changes do we need to make to Postgres to be able to use these three features effectively? And for that, I'll hand over to Bilal. Uh, so the read streams, that is the feature that we added into the Postgres 70. Uh, reading a blocks of relation data is a very common operation in Postgres. 
In Postgres source tree, you will see that there are many calls to that function named read buffer. That read buffer function takes a relation object and the block number as an argument. And if the related buffer is already in the buffer pool, it just pins it, meaning that the buffer won't move, it will stay put. And then uh, it returns that buffer straight back to you. But if the buffer is not already in the buffer pool, then uh, that function uh, needs to load that data the buffer pool by doing an IO. Uh, in that process, it might kick some data out of the buffer pool to create some space, but we hope that uh, it won't be that much common. After that, uh, at the end, it doesn't read system call before pinning and giving buffer back to you. So uh, that is a very common operation in Postgres. You will see that that read buffer function is being called all over the places, such as access methods to access uh, indexes, tables, and so forth. Uh, right now, the question is, if you want to change something to build larger IOs and potentially push some stuff into the background, then we need to find all places that do that and convince them to that uh, grouping and ahead of time behavior. <clears throat> so a bad way to do, a bad way to solve uh, solve that would be that uh, each part of source tree to handle those problems by itself. Of course, instead of that, we want to have some kind of the reusable solution. And what we have uh, come up with is a read streams. In this piece of code, you will see that what uh, PG program more or less looks like, and the PG program is an extension that is used to load, uh, that is used to program buffer pool by uh, reading a relation into the buffer pool. It works like that. It uh, loops over the number of blocks in the relation, then it calls that read buffer function, and after that, it immediately releases that buffer. Actually, other places such as access methods would want to do something with the uh, would want to do something with the data in the buffer pool, but PG program doesn't need that because when the read uh, buffer function is completed, it means that the buffer will be already in the buffer pool. So the new version of that, which is already in Postgres 17, uh, instead of doing that, we create a stream object and give it a callback. The callback functions are used to uh, return block numbers that we need uh, next we will uh, we will need soon to their streams for example in this case in the pg program case its callback function just loops over the number of blocks in the relation as before and uh, it returns this, uh, those block numbers when the stream wants them and after that uh, it immediately releases them and uh, actually having a callback function is important because when we uh, have callback function, we can separate the question of which block we need next from uh, those buffers consumption. And uh, this allows to uh, read stream to do whatever magic it feels like doing. Uh, in the right side of the picture, uh, you see that there is an error coming from the callback function. And uh, it works like that. That stream object uh, calls that callback function whenever it feels like to build larger IOs uh, up to an IO combined limit. And uh, the stream groups these blocks, and after that, uh, later, each of these blocks gets turned into a read system call. Uh, you see that there is a read stream next function in the middle of the screen, in the loop. Uh, so uh, this read stream next function pulls buffers out of the stream, and we can't uh, see or tell that, but in the background, you will see that uh, there are multiple buffers that are being pinned, in, being pinned at the same time, and the uh, IO combining is happening. So uh, if you run strace uh, command in the old version of the PG, pro, uh, PG program, you will see that there are many uh, 8 kilobyte period function calls, but uh, if you run the stream white version, if you run strace on the stream white version, you will see that there are many period P period V function calls uh, for 128 kilobytes. I mean the uh, size of the IO combined limit. So that was the simple uh, sequential version. But uh, what happens if we have the random block numbers? Uh, in that case, think that your uh, callback function returns random block numbers for some reason. So because of that, the uh, stream can't combine these IOs because uh, this, those block numbers are not next to each other always. Sometimes they will be, sometimes to, uh, they won't be. 
But when the stream realizes that it can't build larger IOs, it can't do IO combining, it starts the issue what we called uh, advice. It think advice means that we are telling kernel, hey, we will read this block soon and uh, we will get uh, some help from the kernel. And uh, that is what we called uh, poor man's asynchronous IO. It works like that. We are trying to do issue advice as early as possible. And then we are trying to do read system call as late as possible. So when we uh, do the actual read system call, we hope that kernel already uh, moved buffer to its per, uh, kernel page cache. So we don't go off CPU. And actually that trick is used for many years in Postgres to initiate uh, asynchronous uh, behavior. And actually we will continue to use that trick uh, until we have real asynchronous IO in the background. And uh, in, the, in this case, there is an effective IO concurrency setting to control how many of these imaginary IOs are uh, allowed to run at the same time. Uh, so how uh, do we streamify Postgres? To streamify Postgres, we need to find all places that read buffer function is called, and then we need to turn them into a stream and uh, pull buffers out of the stream instead. And to do that, we need to have a that uh, callback function. Uh, there are relatively simple cases. For example, in the sequential scan case, its callback just loops over the number of blocks in the relation sequentially, for example, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. And then uh, it returns those block numbers when the stream wants them. And the analyze case is also uh, simple. In that case, actually, uh, a Knuts algorithm for block sampling is used to get uh, the blocks to analyze. But I mean, uh, this block num sorry, this algorithm is uh, quite a bit complicated, but it already exists in some function. So you just need to put that function into the analysis callback and it will work. Uh, uh, streamifying these parts are uh, relatively simple because uh, those callback doesn't interact anything else in a complicated way. So you can just write callbacks and it is done. Uh, there are more complicated cases. For example, uh, there is a bitmap heap scan. In bitmap heap scan, actually we know uh, where the block numbers and they are in the bitmap. So we need to iterate through the bitmap to get uh, to return those block numbers to its callback. And one quick note of, uh, about bitmap heap scan. In bitmap heap scan, the prefetching uh, is done by using uh, ad hoc code. And uh, when uh, bitmap heap scan gets streamified, uh, we can remove this code because the uh, stream all automatically does the prefetching in the background. Uh, the recovery is another example. In the crash recovery, we have the wall files. So we just need to read ahead those uh, wall files to get block numbers from them uh, when the callback wants them. Uh, that is the callback of the analyze sampling. Uh, you can see that it is pretty simple. And that uh, there are block sampler has more and block sampler next functions from the Knuts algorithm. Uh, it works like that. The block sampler has more function checks uh, if there is still block to sample, and the block sampler next function returns those block numbers. So it works like that. If there is still block to sample, it returns those block numbers, but uh, there is no block to sample. Uh, the callback returns invalid block number to stream, meaning that uh, the stream reached the end. And that is the callback of bitmap heap scan. Uh, I won't go into details, but you can see that it is a more complicated callback. So uh, uh, there is an uh, arrow showing one uh, function, one uh, statement. It says that, I mean, the, uh, the bitmap in that arrow, we are iterating through the bitmap to return those block numbers, but we need a couple of more additional checks before returning uh, those block numbers. And uh, that is work in progress right now. Uh, so if you want to join the discussion and uh, look at the, uh, this callback or how the streamifying process is going, uh, there is a link at the bottom. One of the complexities of this pro uh, one of the complexities of stream uh, streams are deciding how far ahead to look. For example, if you type uh, select star from some table limit one, 
We don't want to immediately read until an IO combined limit, uh, which is 128k. So instead of, uh, we don't want to do uh, any extra IO that Postgres doesn't have to do. So to solve uh, that problem, we have this ramp up idea, ramp up algorithm. It works like that. The stream starts by reading just one block at a time. And if this block gets consumed, then uh, it reads two block and it continues like that uh, up to an IO combined limit. So with that solution, actually we don't do the extra pins and uh, bookkeeping. Uh, there are uh, these uh, look ahead look ahead distance is uh, decided by three main behavior, and now I will explain them. Uh, there are uh, behavior A, B, and C. In the behavior A case, think that you are uh, scanning some table, and it turns out uh, all the blocks of this table are already in the shared buffers. So in that case, there is no point in looking. There is no point looking ahead uh, further than one because actually there is no IO in that case. Like since all buffers are already in the shared buffers, you will just get uh, these blocks, uh, these buffers from there. So you don't, you won't do any IO. And there is a behavior B. In that case, uh, think that you are scanning a sum table and you are doing a sequential scan and all blocks. Uh, in the relation are all blocks in the table are sequential. So in that behavior, there is no point in looking uh, ahead further than IO combined limit because we don't want to do extra pin and bookkeeping. And uh, there is a behavior C. In that case, you are scanning a table and it turns out the uh, blocks are in random order. So in that case, actually it make in that case you will uh, have a lot of uh, IO calls and they will be random and you will have many uh, advice uh, system calls and it makes uh, sense to looking uh, ahead further than IO combined limit in that case uh, because we have that uh, effective IO conquer setting which uh, controls the how many of uh, these IOs uh, can run at the same time. So the uh, summary of this is when the stream uh, realizes that uh, blocks are cached, it this look at distance uh, slowly decreases. And when the stream realizes that uh, it is actually doing an IO, this look at distance uh, rapidly increases. Uh, I want to say that uh, this algorithm will have uh, actually rework when the uh, asynchronous IO comes. And uh, that is the S trace output of, output of the sequential scan. Uh, you can see that the stream starts by reading just one block, which is uh, eight kilobytes, and it will read uh, two blocks, sixteen kilobytes, and it uh, continues like that and up to an IO combined limit, and uh, it will uh, continue like that. That is the S trace output of the random scans. You see that there are many uh, read and uh, advice system costs in the random scans. And if you look at the colored numbers, you can see that first we are doing F advice, then uh, we are doing an actual read system call later. And actually that is an example of what we called uh, poor man's asynchronous IO. And in the random scan case, actually the stream also continue to, uh, tries to continue to uh, build larger IO combined, uh, build larger IOs. And uh, you can see that uh, at the bottom, uh, there is a two blocks read. That is when the stream uh, realizes two blocks are uh, next to each other. So uh, there are some uh, streamification projects. And the sequential scan and analyze something and PG program are streamified and uh, they are released with uh, Postgres 17. Uh, using streams in PG visibility and uh, create database command when strategies volloc are committed to Postgres 18 and uh, hopefully they will be released with Postgres 18. And uh, there is uh, using streams in vacuum, auto program and bitmap tip scan and recovery. Uh, these are working progress in right now and hopefully they will be completed until uh, Postgres 18. So are we done? Uh, not yet. Uh, there are uh, still 
places to streamify. For example, we, uh, we need to streamify index scans and the access methods. And the good thing about that is when you streamify something, you will see immediate benefit uh, from the IO combining at, and the, that read ahead advice. Also, uh, when, this, when you streamify something, uh, it will ready to uh, that uh, asynchronous IO change. Hopefully, they will be coming soon. Uh, now, uh, Thomas will continue with uh, experimental, experimental work on IO streaming. So here's a kind of grab bag of um, ideas that we've been trying out, um, some of which might eventually produce a, a useful product. Um, so for one thing, the, the current read stream system can only access the blocks of one relation. Um, for the recovery, uh, um, for streamifying recovery, the wall refers to many different relations. And I kind of, at some point, tried to have a whole hash table full of many, many read streams, but that didn't make any sense. And it, it, it just didn't work. So um, there's a multi-relation version. Uh, another thing that um, uh, is interesting to think about, and I've been talking to a couple of people about this, I think it might make sense, is to have an automatic read stream for cases where, where it's very hard to predict the, the sequence, but um, you can detect, you could have a drop-in replacement for the, for the read buffer function where you tell it what buffer number you want next, and it tries to guess what it, what the next one's going to be and speculatively prefetches blocks, much in the way that the, the, the kernel does when you do a, a sequential scan. The idea for that is that, I mean, sort of the idea behind that is that there are some cases like index scans that benefit from the kernel's help right now, but when we turn on direct IO, that's not going to work anymore. And we don't want any of those cases to, to get worse just because we can't figure out how to do precise prediction of the of um, future blocks. So we want some kind of heuristic way to solve that problem. Um, there's another um, interesting area to research, which is out of order streams. So for example, if you're vacuuming a table, you need to look at every block. You don't care which order you access the blocks in. And some of them are already in the buffer pool maybe. You might as well get started vacuuming those blocks right now because they're already in memory um, while IOs run to, to read future blocks in. And the only way you could do that um, and, and get good results from it would be if you could tell the stream, I don't care about the order, just give me, I'm going to give you the block numbers, you give me the buffers in any order that, that you can, whatever is most efficient. Um, and there are probably other ways to optimize things uh, by reordering, uh, but we don't do that yet. Um, there's a couple of, all of this work is driven by IO, but there aren't, we kind of started to realize that there are things you can speed up, even when you don't have to do IO by thinking in terms of streams. Um, one of them is that, um, you know, way above the disk, you've got memory, and memory has a whole prefetching world of pain as well, right? So if you are if you know that you're going to be ac accessing a certain uh, sequence of blocks in the buffer pool, and they're already cached, you can you can also tell the the CPU to start prefetching um, bits of those future pages ahead of time. It's very hard to tune. It's very hard to get the timing right so that it always wins. But there are ways to speed. For example, in early experiments, we've been able to speed up simple sequential scans by up to 10% when the when the data was already fully in the buffer pool using memory prefetching tricks. So that's an interesting one. Another idea is that this ongoing work or experimental work to try and use a, a tree structure um, instead of a hash table for the buffer mapping table. And that would allow you to look up multiple buffers at the same time in a range um, with just sort of one search, instead of doing multiple hash table lookups that involves locking because it's a, lock, a locked, partitioned locked hash table. So, um, and, and in order to be able to build a decent range to look up, you obviously would need to look into the future again. So that's another example of a, a potential benefit from streamifying um, access patterns, even when no IO is needed. Um, I was looking around for an example extension to try and streamify, just to see the, what the experience would be like of streamifying something that 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 um, isn't part of core Postgres. And I actually wrote this code um, during the the Postgres conference in Vancouver earlier this year in the hallway because everyone was talking about how cool PG Vector is, and I was like, okay, great, I'll pick that one. I'll go and have a look and see how if I can. And someone described to me that the way that the the graph search works and like it was immediately obvious that it can predict um, quite a few blocks in advance of of how it's going to scan um, 
a um, an HNSW index. So this is something that's very popular right now because it's involved in uh, in um, high dimensional vector searching as used in AI projects. I don't know anything about that, but I could see that that the way that it acts at blocks was um, quite predictable. So with just a few lines of code, I was able to get um, hold HNSW uh, searches to go four times faster. Excuse me. Someone told me that that's not very interesting for PG vector because everyone knows that you have to rewarm your HNSW indexes, which seems like a bit of a circular argument to me. But anyway, um, um, there are other versions of that kind of uh, family of of indexes that uh, are more more oriented towards data that uh, indexes that don't fit in memory. So I think that was an interesting experiment to see that you can pretty easily streamify an extension. Um, I'm not planning to work on that anymore or propose it anywhere. If anyone else is interested in, in taking that somewhere, please let, please let me know. It's been posted to the mailing list. But, but. Um, so that I've so far we've been talking only about reading, and and we're focused mainly on read streams. Well, only on read streams in, in Postgres 17. And the reason for that is that reading happens all over the tree. It's a very very common kind of I/O, and um, it, we figured it would be useful to get a, 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 an abstraction out for that sooner because it requires changes to many more parts of the tree. Whereas writing, on the other hand, is pretty much only done in around about five places, depending on how you count. The general idea is that you change data in memory and, and those pages become dirty. And then later on, the checkpointer or the background writer hopefully writes that data out for you. So, um, the, you know, there's a whole bunch of vectorized, uh, vectored I/O and and asynchronous I/O and so on that's possible there, and we we have patches in development that that work more or less, but we figured it was better to prioritize the reading side of it because that requires code changes in many places, and we want to um, pair the way for asynchronous I/O um, sooner. Okay, so um, a very quick introduction to what real AIO is about. Um, our Colleague Andres Freund is working on an AIO subsystem, and you can see it on GitHub and check it out and try it. And Bilal will show that in a moment. Um, and the basic idea is that in the places where at the moment we do something like F advise, do some intermediate work, uh, vacuuming, analyzing, whatever, and then later do a P read that we hope completes immediately, that's that's replaced by starting a real read that reads stuff into the buffer pool going away to do the intermediate work and then waiting for completion, which hopefully takes zero time because it, you put those two events far apart enough that it, it doesn't require any actual waiting. Um, so that the infrastructure to make that work, the, there's actually multiple different backends for it uh, because it involves a whole bunch of non-portable stuff that's highly specific to operating systems. There's a synchronous mode that actually just works synchronously with the F advice and so on. That should work on any operating system that that already works on. There's a worker mode that has background processes, and we'll able to talk about that, and there's a Linux-specific version. It's also possible, and we've kind of got pretty janky scripts, uh, patches that sort of work um, for Windows and other operating systems. It's possible as well that um, this could be extensible, and perhaps some of the projects that are doing network storage of interesting exotic kinds could benefit from this as well, right? Like if you're reading data from some kind of magic network storage, you can also get that network transfer happening ahead of time so that you never have to wait for it. Um, so uh, the basic idea here um, that we're trying to explain to everybody here is that the dreaming abstraction allows um, anything that's using it to benefit from that from, from potential future improvements along those lines. Um, but with the AIO patch, instead of IOs being actually just a system call that's running, but not really an object in the Postgres memory space or anything like that. Uh, it becomes an actual object in, in shared memory. You can seek uh, IOs that are running in, in at, at, at the current moment in a, in a view. And um, yeah. So all of this work that's been done so far for 17, it's, it's sort of architectural changes preparing for real direct IO and AIO to kind of, uh, to be honest, catch up with a, a lot of other relational databases and how they've been doing things for many years. So it's this kind of like work plan it allows parallelization of the of the work of getting things ready for that okay so i'll hand over to Bilal. so uh, how to try these uh, asynchronous patches uh, you, you can clone andres's 
repository from GitHub, then uh, check out the asynchronous AO tool branch and just uh, install the Postgres. Or you can uh, go to discussion link where the uh, news related to that asynchronous search is are shared, and you can apply these patches. But uh, most probably Andres's uh, branch will be more recent, so you can try that. Uh, there are three possible uh, I/O methods in the asynchronous AI patches for now. The first one is sync. That is actually the synchronous one, non-asynchronous one. So it just works like uh, Postgres 17, and it is mostly used for comparison, uh, comparison, understanding, and testing. So it doesn't do any asynchronous AI. It relies on the uh, sit, uh, read streams, and uh, when you Disable di sorry when you uh, enable the direct IO, it starts to perform worse because then it will uh, lose that uh, kernel's help for the read ahead heuristics. Uh, second one is uh, IO worker. In that case, the all IO requests are uh, offloaded to IO worker processes, and a number of these processes are controlled by uh, IO worker set IO worker setting. Uh, and there is an idea that making a uh, number of I workers will change depending on a need at a time. And uh, that is the example process three of when the I workers are equal to three. You can see that there are three new workers. Uh, there are three new I worker process to do an IO. And uh, that is the S3 output of the I worker processes. Some uh, backend process, let's say a client process. Uh, starts to uh, query or starts to doing an IO, and these IO requests are offloaded to worker process, and they are done by uh, that worker processes, so that uh, the client is idle. It can work on other tasks while uh, these IO requests are uh, waiting, completing from the worker process. And the third one is IO ring In that uh, IO method, there are submission queues and the completion queues. So it works like that. You put your request into the submission queue, and when uh, that request is uh, gets completed, it is getting written into the completion queue, and uh, there is an IO ring enter uh, system call. So uh, you use that IO ring enter system call for both uh, putting something into the submission queue and uh, waiting something from the completion queue. And that I think uh, enter system call uh, replaces the all other system calls and gives you an asynchronous behavior. Uh, that is the S trace output of the I U ring for the simple sequential scan. Uh, you can see that there is only a U ring enter system call. There are no uh, read or F advice advice system calls in that case. And uh, I did a simple benchmark uh, by using uh, asynchronous patch set. I set uh, auto vacuum to off, effective concurrence to 128, and I combine them to 32, so they don't cause any regression or throttle. Mm -hmm. I create the table by using PG bench, and the total uh, size of the table is uh, 72 gigabyte. And I use simple uh, sequential scan uh, aggregation query on that table. So that is the that table shows the uh, timing results of this. Uh, it it compares the IO ring worker and the release 17 with different IO direct settings, but uh, IO direct setting is always enabled for release 17 because like if we enable it, it will cause a regression. So you can see that although the IO direct is disabled for the asynchronous AI patches, uh, it approximately two times better than release 17, and it gets better when we uh, enable the direct IO. And there is a, another table shows uh, how many CPU cycles CPU cycles are spent with different IO direct settings. Uh, you can see that with uh, when the IO direct is enabled, we spent uh, much less uh, CPU cycles, so that uh, CPU can work on other tasks when the IO direct is uh, enabled. And then now Thomas will talk about conclusion. So the main takeaway ideas for, 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 from this talk, I hope, are that the streaming abstraction enables a whole bunch of optimizations um, 
already now, but also we can see many potential future improvements. So if you work on an extension or um, if you work on, on core Postgres or you want to, and, and the, you can see some parts of, the, of, of either of those things that could benefit from streamification, um, you know, we're happy to help or give feedback or anything, any way we can help. Um, and if you, uh, we'd certainly would be especially interested to hear from people who try to do that and find that they can't for some reason because the abstraction is not good enough or there's some obvious thing it needs to have added to it or whatever. That's that's something that would be really cool to hear. Um, and uh, you can try all this stuff out. Uh, and please do. That's the end of our talk. Does anyone have any questions? Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't see the mic. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so question around, less question, more comment. So when you're talking about PG vectors specifically, I'm really curious where some of this guidance is coming from, or if it's you know mistakenly coming from me, because I oh. think there's definitely benefits to the to utilizing Stream IO, particularly on HNSW. Yeah. Um, definitely more chat about it offline, but with uh, a lot of the targeted guidance for the vector scans, like with the graph, most like everything's stored in the lowest layer, and a lot of that won't be cached in memory, particularly as these systems grow larger. So certainly yeah. a benefit to streaming IO there. Additionally, uh, the the clustering method, the clusters tend to be stored in blocks because you have to build the, all of that up front, and there should hopefully be like a you know very big benefit to using streaming I/O there. Yeah, I think it's I I think it must be true that you can get benefit from almost any index that, and 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 I think there's definitely possibilities there. If you want to sit together and hack on some code, that would be cool. That that sounds that sounds great. But yes, of course. But in general, if you can keep most of that in memory, yes, it'll be faster. But you know, I think we're starting to hit the the practical limits of doing that. Yeah, I guess I should probably just come come out, come clean, and say I'm trying to get someone else to pick that work up. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy to try ideas out in in yeah. ha quick hacking sessions or whatever. So cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff overall. Thank you. Very, very basic, very basic question. Um, and does this how is this unrelated to vectorizing operational stuff? Yeah. And and please try that on post GIS, not not only Fiji vector. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've noticed that people use the word vectored when they're talking about IO and vectorized when they're talking about um, please, please things please that CPUs do to run the same like SIMD, you know, the same operation on multiple data. They're very different things at very different layers. I've just noticed a tendency for vectored and vectorized to be used. And here we're talking about vectored. It has nothing to do with vectorizing um, arithmetic or anything like that. Although that is a very cool subject and I wish we had it. Okay. So, sorry for mixing. I mean, I, 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 I'm with you that it has nothing to do with the large language model vector, vectorize, uh -huh. of, of course. Okay. And that was the side mark to try your streaming stuff on the, uh, post GIS geometry, uh, reading, reading and writing. My question was, is um, DocDB, for example, uh, ad advertises that they are vectorizing operations. Uh -huh. That's a third so, so somehow uh, uh, thing. But how is this, is this related to uh, vectorizing operations? Um, so the word vector is being used in about three different ways in this. <laughs> So PG vectors storing vectors, which are like tuples, right? Sort of. Uh, and we're talking about, um, the, yeah. I didn't fully understand your question, so I'm trying to trying to find it. So you, in, in that particular index type, each page um, contains pointers to say 16 other pages, which are, um, potential candidates for being within the k nearest neighbors and so it's inherently parallelizable to read those things in at the same time and at the moment if you use pg vector hnsw search or at least as of last time i looked at it it'll do that but it'll read those 16 pages it already knows the, the identity of the 16 pages it needs to read in it'll do them one after another 
and we can parallelize that. So that's why it goes faster. Just to be clear, uh, as opposite to, to Volcana style, Volcana, th that's what I meant. Ah. Right. That's yes, that's a fourth meaning of the word vector. <laughs> it's a... <laughs> yeah. Um. How, what will be the case in index scan, how the vectorization will help there? Yeah, right. So index scans are really interesting. There's, there's at least two different parts to it. Uh -huh. One part is how you can predict future access to the pages within the index itself, um, which in some cases can be quite difficult. Um, and second thing is um, in Postgres, indexes are all kind of secondary, right? You, always, you almost always finish up following a, a pointer to a heat page. Um, and that can also be uh, parallelized quite well, you know, concurrent IO. And so there's potential to use two different streams in an index stream. Uh, in an index scan uh, because your index scan is part of something else and one way to make that work without having to do any one way to make that work with patches that we already have is to use bitmap index scans because then the index scan produces a bitmap the bitmap is 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 a very easy way to find the heat pages and that can be parallelized but um work is being done uh, i think uh, our colleague Tomas Vondra, who's over here is doing some in some it's some research into that uh on how to do that without involving a bitmap scan because you don't always want to use one of those. Um, does that that's the question? All right. Um, let's imagine that all the streamification is done and also your automatic stream is available. Uh, is it uh, enough to turn on direct IO or do we need, or do we really need the true async IO? Um, so the automatic read stream thing, I, I only have really experimental patches for that. And I, I've been able to determine that it works okay for fixing regressions in index scans that previously benefited from uh, the kernels look at. But uh, I haven't really figured out all the other places that might have the same problem. So we don't really have a very good list right now of all of the, all of the regressions that come from uh, Losing the losing the kernel page cache. Um, that would be a nice list to have. Thanks. And to be clear, I meant the automatic read stream plus AIO, not on its own, because it's on its own. It can't actually do anything. It can't. You can't do anything with the predictions if you don't have a page cache uh, or AIO. You need one of those two things to get um, to benefit from any predictions, right? Yeah. Has any of that been applied to toast data? So reading toast chunks and perhaps predicting which toast values will be needed? I'm not aware of that. That's but that that's sounds a, useful. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely something that would be needed. Any other questions? Thank you. Please uh, don't go out yet. There are two announcements. Uh, 